Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales of Demystified podcast. And today we're joined by Arup Chakravarti, um, who currently, well, who actually has probably the best background from any guest we've had on this show previously. So Arup, congratulations on the background before we get started. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, You're overselling already, Tom. (laughs) Um, no, but Arup is head of sales <laughs> enablement and commercial analytics at Elevon Europe. Um, Arup has about a 12 to 13 year career at American Express um, in various different roles. And I actually want to dig into this um, and dig into Arup's views on sales enablement versus sales operations, et cetera, and this whole thing. Um, so, Arup, first of all, welcome to the show. And second of all, could you? Give us a little bit of background on you and how you kind of got into this space. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I started my corporate career uh, a long way back at the, at the turn of the century, back in the early noughties at American Express and started as a sales performance analyst. Uh, and that was doing, you know, a number of the, the key disciplines that are now part of sales operations, but, you know, a number of key disciplines around Target setting, quota definition, incentive payments—you know, managing even the the, the execution of the, the quarterly payments, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, this is back in the in the dark ages, Tom. Right? So you probably hadn't even been born back then, right? <laughs> back then, we didn't have anything like Barrison or anything of that nature. Right? Our, our Barrison back then was a a massive um, Excel Excel workbook that uh, that you had to maintain very sensitively because I had a lot of uh, a, a very sensitive information in it. But yeah, that's that's kind of tracking back to the early part. And then I've been, I think, lucky over my career. And and, and actually, having um, heard a number of the the, the podcasts that, that that you've hosted, I think one of the common themes is that um, practitioners in in sales enablement or sales operations don't necessarily. Um, start out carving out that career pathway for themselves. They, they tend to sort of fall into it, and, and and they're quite passionate about a number of the processes and the technologies and the you know the the, the activities associated with it. And, and you know the, the, the story is very much the same for me. I think over the uh, over the following ten to twelve years at American Express, I started to um, gain uh, experience across uh, a number of the disciplines associated with sales operations, and then you know increased. Um, Increased in terms of uh, uh, responsibility set and, and in terms of uh, 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 authority and you know and, 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 and growth in terms of my, my career right so so I've been very lucky in that respect um, and and actually you know when I was going back in, and I know when we first started talking we had a little bit of a, a, a mini debate around you know this 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 emerging discipline around sales enablement and how does that differ from sales operations etc. And I had a little bit of a think about that, and I did kind of want to express my own opinion on this one because I think I think that the, the sort of the debate is as with 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 all things um, human, when you start to uh, to get into debates uh, that differentiate one group versus another, it can, it can become a little bit of motive, et cetera, et cetera. So I did I kind of tracked this back and started to think about it, um, and I and I have. I guess what I call five kind of pillars of, of sales operations. Well, they're, they're, they're almost like five operating domains. And then they're pretty standard. You've got territory optimization in there. You've got, you know, quota management and, of course, sales incentive program management. Uh, you've got, of course, um, CRM, sales automation, et cetera. Uh, you naturally have monitoring and any type of sales performance and management information that comes out of that. And I think the fifth pillar, which is really key, is, um, influencing sales culture, helping define and build out of sales culture. And I think typically in sales operations, historically, the first four around charity optimization, quota and sales incentive, sales automation, sales performance, those have been really kind of the anchoring pillars around sales operations. And I think where sales enablement has emerged more recently, there's been that bias towards learning and development, onboarding, some of the softer skills in terms of the competency development. And again, I think that really ties into that fifth pillar around influencing sales culture, right? That's, that's, that's where you've got the bias around. There is a particular way in which a company wants to sell and should be selling. Um, and so therefore, L&D are really, really sort of central uh, to that process. I, I really don't think, and, I, you know, and I've attended and presented it, sales enablement summits. I really don't think there is much 
differential in arguing the toss over which is more strategic or which is more tactical, et cetera, et cetera. I think for me, it's, you know, you've got these five pillars. You want to be able to enable your sales and account managers with the right sets of skills and, and, and the right toolkits and, and, and the right motivating factors to go out and do a great job when they're out there, whether you call that sales enablement or whether you call that sales operations. I mean, it's really argued with us. I think everybody at, at this stage is, is, is delivering strategic value to their organizations. I, I'd say, the, to me, the bit that differentiates is sales enablement has a bit more of that learning and that skew. Got it. I don't know if that and resonates so, with me. I know, I know we've, we've talked yeah, yeah. this as well. Yeah, I mean, so so do you then, like in your role, are you split over the five pillars or do you work with sales operations for different parts of that, of those five pillars? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. So actually at Elevon today, I say there's three roles. Um, one uh, peer role within the, the commercial director, I, I, I reported to the commercial director, so a peer role who's the head of operational excellence that will look after a couple of the, the core processes that sit on the sales operations. And also for the both of us, we have a very strong collaborative engagement with the head of European learning and development. Again, just in that context of wanting to bring all of the different parties together so that you know, we're fundamentally working towards getting the right person with the right message and the right skill set in front of the right prospect slash customer at the right time. And I think everybody kind of works towards that. I have a good chunk of that. Um, and, and my role at Elevon in terms of self-enablement, commercial analytics, I'm quite lucky because on the one side, I have a, a technical remit that is uh, about deploying sales automation and CRM and, and, and actually increasingly marketing automation and, and MarTech tools as well. And on the other side, I've got the commercial analytics piece, which gives me much more of a traditional analytics skill set where the guys on that part of my team, you know, they, they do deal analytics, they do business case development, they do sales performance analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm in the process of building out a greater synergy between the two parts of the team. But there is a lot of opportunity there, right? It's, it's about, um, you know, we've got the, the, the right platforms and the right applications to be able to drive real value to our salespeople. Are we actually engaging our sales salespeople in a way? Can we see that end result coming through? And, and the analytic part of my team are, are, are really kind of, again, synergistically helping build up that overarching picture. So uh, I feel quite lucky in that respect. However, as I, as I mentioned, I don't own L&D, you know, that there are other processes that, that sit with the head of our operation that's got it and just to give the audience a sense what kind of scale of sales team and then operations team whether that's operations l d commercial like what's the scale of the sales organization and what's the scale of the the operational team that's supporting them yeah okay um so across europe we have in the region of about 400 sales uh, and account managers, right? So these are field uh, staff that uh, you know, are either directly um, having you know, direct in-person one-to-one relationships with customers or prospects or prospects. Uh, we divide in terms of Alibon into two classic functions of uh, you know, uh, hunters and farmers. So you know, sales go out, they do the hunting. Once that account has been with sales for a period of time, and it's appropriate to hand it over, then it goes over to the account management group for, for additional farming. And actually, account management would be on point for being able to uh, do uh, cross-sell, upsell, further engagement, et cetera. Got operations, it. Sorry. The operations yeah. fees, again, so if you're looking at um, a centralized approach, so within the uh, commercial directorate, um, let's take that as a, 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 sort of a good example of a, a central support team. You're looking at about 50 to 60 odd people there. And that covers my team, Operation Mechanisms. Again, our head of marketing for Europe is one of our peers within that team. So she, she's one of my peers. I mean, the biggest chunk within that team is actually probably marketing across the, um, the European organization. Uh, and then if you're looking at true customer services and, and operations, I mean, that's, that's a huge team. You're looking at Nyon. 800, 900 odd people, they're all Warsaw based from a back office perspective. Got it. And what this are like of the team that you would call sales operations that would encounter, like also encompass enablement, out of the 50 and 60, how many is that? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, well, my, my oh, I'd probably say we've got around about 
um, 20 odd people across the European organization, um, 10 to 12 of that within my team, and then the balance across learning and development uh, and some other smaller, uh, more um, hub-based uh, analytics teams that, that would be participating in that, that kind of sales ops sales and uh, activity. Got it. Awesome. And now, can we fast forward to today and the current sales tech stack you guys are running? Sure. Um, so, um, uh, again, just taking a very simplified workflow here. Um, up front, um, of course, we have uh, our, our, our own website uh, that will be driven by a number of different Adobe products. Uh, we don't have a lot of, um, today, uh, website-based tracking. Um, so again, you know, tools like uh, PodOps, uh, or again, and there are a number of other Adobe tools that allow you to understand who's visiting, try to sort of decipher some of the anonymity of visitors to your site and, and give you kind of trackability and um, a, a view in terms of um, repeat visits, et cetera, et cetera. There are a number of those tools that we don't have in place today. Um, we're certainly looking at in terms of um, expanding out our toolkit. But of course, as you go through the workflow, you've got, you know, uh, uh, visitors hitting your uh, website or our website we've naturally got web to lead pages either through the process of encouraging some kind of white paper download etc cetera, etc cetera, or through some SEO campaign that we've driven we've got landing sites we've got landing pages we, we definitely have web to lead that naturally takes us into sales cloud into Salesforce and sales cloud that's, that's the CRM system that we utilize um, and you know the, the full functionality through sales cloud so pipeline, deal management, account management. Um, and then slightly downstream, uh, in terms of, again, our MarTech, we're not using Pardot, a Salesforce product, um, which is kind of top funnel. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool for, you know, top of funnel assessment, lead scoring, visitor, uh, uh, you know, calibration, et cetera, et cetera, drive sales effectiveness. We're not utilizing that. It, that is something that I'd like to explore. We're using more bottom of funnel marketing technology. In fact, we're using Marketing Cloud, again, another Salesforce product, which delivers email communication, automation of, of that communication. And actually, Marketing Cloud is a, is a great product for, for deep um, uh, communication personalization. So our MarTech is, is more bottom of funnel as opposed to necessarily top of funnel. And we're kind of starting to explore what do we need to bring in for that top of funnel need. The final piece I actually want to talk through is, and I'll talk about it maybe in one of the, 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 the latest sort of probing questions that you have as well. I'll touch on it very lightly at the moment. We we're working with uh, an outsourced uh, artificial intelligence machine learning uh, provider. It's a company called Lattice Engine. They're in the leader segment on um, Forest Away, a great company, um, and we've been utilizing them to undertake, uh, again, predictive analytics, next best action, account-based marketing, and a number of those different activities. We're doing that still somewhat manually, still, you know, there's, there's always opportunities to deliver more integration, more automation, et cetera, et cetera. We're utilizing their technology really in a kind of campaign mechanism uh, uh, way as well. So all of that information comes through. We then make the assessment. We then service that back out to sales or to account management just to Again, utilizing AI and, and machine learning to be able to help steer sales and account management to more um, effective and productive conversations. Got it. What was the name of that that final one? Uh, Lattice, Lattice Engine, L-A-T-T-I-C-E, Lattice Engine. Awesome. They're an American American company, I think, recently purchased by Dun & Bradstreet, um, and pegged as a, a customer data platform provider, but actually what we find is that their predictive analytics uh, and AI algorithmic uh, modeling is, is, is fantastic. Got it. Um, can you talk about time either at American Express or recently at Elevon where you have done something that's changed the sales process or changed the way the salespeople do something that has led to significant results? It sounds like yeah, an interview so question, actually- but... <laughs> that sounds like an thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> so let me let me come back to um to Lattice actually and, and just talk about the deployment of, of AI, right? And 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 actually, you know what when we when we first looked at AI, you know, and this is this is going back to 
uh, late 2018 uh, before rolling into early 2019. And I was kind of skeptical about how much value would this really bring. Um, and, and, you know, clearly I didn't have a, a strong enough understanding as well in terms of the AI environment. What, what could that deliver? And the, the, the promise was still unclear to me in, in many respects. Uh, what, I, what I first realized was that uh, actually you don't have to go full guns blazing around AI, right? It doesn't have to be fully integrated into um, all of the different technology that you have. You, you can go that way, right? And, and increasingly you'll find, um, you know, uh, uh, providers such as Salesforce.com themselves with their Einstein capability, right? Integrated into so many different aspects of their product that and actually, to some extent, it can become a little bit overwhelming and a little bit confusing, right? Particularly when you're then trying to assess, should you go with a native product such as Einstein that's already embedded into CRM, or should you should you look at a different provider, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of providers out there. And, and, and actually, AI is, 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 is kind of very funky and very buzzy at the moment. So, you know, it can in, it, in its own way be, be quite overwhelming and a little bit confusing. But when we looked at AI, I was a little bit skeptical as to, to the value that we would get from what we did was we took it just on a discipline, step by step, broke it down. What did we want to do with it? The promise was really about increasing sales effectiveness, increasing sales productivity, right? And that was very much a case of, you know, if you've got 100 deals, uh, don't spend all of your time and energy focused on each one of those on an equitable basis. If you get an, an AI algorithmic environment that you can model and train with what does a good profile customer versus a not so good profile customer look like, then when you've got your 100 leads, push that through the system and let the AI environment come back to you and tell you, well, actually, you know, out of 100 that you've just pushed through, these are the top 20% that we're going to deliver the most amount of value, right? And it just boils down to that really simple Pareto principle. Where's the 20% that I need to focus the most amount of my energy because they'll close faster uh, and I'll get more, you know, I'll get more accelerated conversion ratio and, and ultimately more, more bang for my buck. When we started to pilot Lattice and the AI environment, the results that we started to, to get through were, were really interesting. I mean, really, really phenomenal as well. So in terms of the pilot run, I mean, what we did was um, take a bunch of, um, recycled and, uh, and win back as in lost customers to so take a, a bunch of uh, leads and, and, and old customers that we've lost, push them through the modeling environment, having trained the models, push them through the modeling environment, and then actually surface that back out to our sales teams without providing any of the scoring that came through from the lattice environment. So effectively, what we did was we blind tested all of the leads that went in. And we just wanted to make sure that there wasn't a self-fulfilling um, outcome because the salespeople were were seeing a strong fit uh, um, um, predictive score come from Lattice and then actually inevitably focusing their effort and their energy there. We just wanted them to somewhat encounter uh, to, to what I've just expressed. And we wanted them to express, uh, I'm sorry, expend all of their energy equitably. And then we wanted to see if the stuff that Lattice was saying was actually, this is really sweet, focus your effort and energy here, was actually genuinely the case. And it was, and we found that across the board, uh, and, and, and remember, again, this is this is ultimately uh, not not that we would do this, but this is ultimately effectively a, a, a cold campaign. Like it's becoming a cold call campaign when you've got winbacks that you, you know, customers that you've lost in the past, deals that you've not closed in the past, recycled leads. You're getting back in touch with customers that had initially and previously said either thank you, but but no, or actually no longer interested in your products and services. Getting back in touch with them, what we found was it was almost a, a two and a half uh, times qualification uplift on the strong fit results that, that Lattice had pushed through to us, right? So again, very simple scoring methodology that Lattice provides where there's a really strong fit. Our qualification ratios coming through on that were, were about 20% as opposed to the qualification ratios that were coming across the board, the lower fit at around eight, 9%. So we immediately found, you know, that the uh, engagement that, that we were getting from sales as they started to see the results was really positive. It, it's one of those tools and processes that, um, that really, I mean, you know, like that, that, the, the process of selling that into the sales organization, it, it was really quite simple. Right? As, as soon as they started to, to see the results that were coming through, they started to have some belief in that. Um, it started to generate its, its own energy. And that was early 2019. And actually, we've worked through that through the course of 2019 and, and looked at other use cases and other parts of the business. So not just 
prospective cold sales, but actually using it very effectively in terms of retention, trying to get ahead of uh, potential cancellations with our existing book of customers. And again, it's been very strong and very positive in terms of surfacing out where we should focus our energy. And, and, and the demand for it has been, has been really positive with the organization. Got it. So do you run all like all outbound leads and then all inbound leads? Do you now run through Lattice to prioritize salespeople time? We should do. Uh, and yes, Lattice, you know, works very closely with Salesforce. So there's a lot of integration capabilities there. We've built some of that out. Um, I, I, you know, I need to get, I'll put my hands up. We're working across a, a number of areas uh, and trying to get a number of different capabilities in place. Um, and that's one of the capabilities that's definitely a, a big priority for, for this year. I need to get more of that automation in place so that you get a very clean flow through, right? As a lead comes in or as a lead is self-sourced and then plugged into the system by a salesperson, it should then go off. It won't be real time. We'll do it overnight because it's just simpler. But it should go over to Lattice, be scored by Lattice, and, and, and a huge amount of information return, both the score and a little bit of data enrichment. And that gives the salesperson, as they go back into the system the following day, some real clear guidance in terms of where they should be focusing their energy. We need to do a little bit more of that. The moment it's a bit manual, we're taking information out of Salesforce, pushing it into Lattice, doing the scoring there, getting it back out. Then, you know, again, again, manually loading that back up to Salesforce. We'll get there. It's just, I think we're almost there. But Got it. We're I mean, it sounds, our sounds like the future of sales. Um, cool. So I now this is a big question. Um, I think you, you you spent a while in like business metrics and analytics, right? If you could sure. only measure one sales related metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? This was not in the question list. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so the question is uh, slightly modified. <laughs> yeah, no, I get you. I get you. Um, if I was to look at uh, at, at one um, at one metric, I don't know. I I guess it would for me. I think it would have to be something that relates to to productivity. Now I'm trying to give you a wishy washy answer here. Um, I think um, you know a lot of organisations measure the output of productivity such as revenue uh, and, and you know and, 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 and the financials um, which which is great which you need to of course measure because you know financials are ultimately particularly within commercial organizations financials are ultimately the, uh, uh, you know, the mechanism by which you know they're going to hit your full year plan etc cetera, etc cetera. of course people are paid on financials across the organization from top all the way through to, to, to bottom um, if I was to measure one thing, I would maybe move the focus away from financials and try and find one of the productivity drivers behind that. I, I don't even know if I would look at sales. I think I would go even one, uh, uh, diagnostically, I would go maybe one level down, even from a sales number, right? I, and I'd look at maybe something that was a, a core component of being able to drive sales. And again, you've caught me off guard here a little bit. So um, sales productivity is important. Absolutely. Um, so I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd probably look at that. I'd probably look at um, sales productivity in terms of how many, how many widgets are we going through? Because the number of widgets, I guess, gives you a, a good sense of, uh, you know, are you, are you going to have the underlying business performance to be able to hit that financial, financial outcome? Got it. So you wouldn't look at revenue. You look at the, the number of licenses or et cetera that each rep is, is selling. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Widgets. I think it, it would be some, exactly. I mean, I suppose. Look, you could track it all the way back, and, and you know, and, and and assess the number of meetings that a rep is undertaking, right? And really, there should be a combination of leading and lagging indicators. Even even sales outcome is really a lagging indicator. It's an underlying driver to financials, but it's still a lagging indicator, right? It's not a leading indicator. And, and ideally, you want to have a blend of both leading and lagging to give you a good sense of do you have enough, uh, you know, do you have enough momentum in place to be able to get to the sales results that you need to be able to then get to the revenue that that, that you want. Right? So, uh, yeah, got it. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and then final question. This one's going really fast. Um, who in your career has inspired you the most or taught you the most about related to sales operations slash enablement? 
Sure. Uh, and actually, so I did prepare this one. And uh, this, is, this is a shout out to um, one of my, my old bosses, actually, at American Express, a gentleman called Scott Parker. And uh, he headed up the, um, uh, the, the CRM team. This is back in. I worked for Scott through the course of 2009 all the way through to 2011. Back into 2008, actually, I joined his team. And at the time, um, uh, uh, you know, we went through the process of rolling out Salesforce.com to one of the, the major lines of business at American Express um, across 21 international markets. And I, you know, I led that program project manager really enjoyed reporting into to scott he was phoenix arizona based he is phoenix arizona based still with american express he's now i know one of the vice presidents of product engineering there for, for amex technologies but i think what i really valued as a learning experience from from scott was uh, was a couple of things i mean when we were deploying salesforce when i was deploying salesforce across 21 international markets, that was literally in the maelstrom of the global financial crisis, right? So there was a huge amount of question. I mean, Amex went from about 60, through that process, through 2009, Amex went from about 60,000 employees down to about 45,000 employees. So when you're deploying, uh, you know, a million dollar project uh, across a number of markets um, and you have colleagues that are, um, also going through some 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 you know some some very difficult um, um, chapters within their own life, there is that natural question around: is is this something appropriate for the business to be investing in? You know, why should we continue to do this, et cetera, et cetera? And I think what Scott taught me was um, there's there's a degree of um, uh, you know uh, balance and and um, uh, kind of almost like elegance that you need to maintain through that period. You've got to continue to sell the vision. You've got to continue to be positive around it. You've got to be sensitive to it as well. Um, you know, selling the vision and, and, and building out the yard of the possible for the future. Yes, that's wonderful, but you still have to to, to manage that message um, very very carefully when when you're going through that that you know that that kind of a, a you know a challenge. So I think what I really I don't I know. Sky, I think the question is: Is your sales ops ninja? I, I don't know, Scott or, or myself, whatever kind of characterize ourselves as, as ninjas, but I think what 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 um so what what Scott taught me was how do you how do you take a um a, a, an automation role um but still make it really important and and, um, and critical for, for for people in the organization and, and how do you do that in a balanced way. Got it. Awesome. Arup, we are going to pause there. Here are three things I, that I took out of the session. Um, looking at the difference between operations and enablement in that way, as in operations, or like enablement is more bit like helping to build the sales culture is something that I haven't heard before, which I thought was super interesting. The thing you're doing with Lattice, I genuinely think is probably the future of sales. Like having a computer telling you which leads to go for first is like, yeah, uh, I, I think in like five years, everyone will have that. And so, and but I haven't heard of anyone doing it. So, you guys are obviously ahead okay. of the curve. Um, and then leading and like lagging in indicators and the, the difference, like the different value you can get from those metrics. When I when I tricked you with that final question. Um, <laughs> So, so Arup, thank you so much for coming on. I know I think you just came off a flight from Japan, so you, you performed incredibly well for someone who is thank probably jet lagged. So, Arup, thank you so much. No, no, it's been a pleasure, Tom. And, and thank you so much for having me uh, on the podcast as well. It's been, it's been very, very, very pleasure.